Shri Goswami said, Once, O King, as a group of sages were performing a Vedic sacrifice on the banks of the Saraswati River, a controversy arose among them as to which of the three chief deities is supreme. Purport. The three chief deities mentioned here are Lord Vishnu, Lord Brahma, and Lord Shiv. Hare Krishna. So, this particular narration, Sri Goswami said right after he narrated how Lord Shiv was saved from Vasvasu, the one who received the wound but was immediately ready to test it out on Lord Shiva himself. Is it 1089? Yes. Shiva Bhagavatam, 10 and to chapter 89, as I stated earlier. So here, 
it started with not Lord Krishna's pastime. It started with a much earlier pastime that had happened in the past. And this was the time where the sages were not even aware of the primary creation. So this is the time where the Saptarishis and all the great sages, they gather at the bank of Saraswati River. And there they were performing this Satra sacrifice. And during the sacrifice, they were trying to identify, like, you know, what is the purpose of the sacrifice, of course, and so forth. And there arose, you know, as you are making the offering, there arose a doubt. So, third, with third, you know, those are the terms. Third is, you know, something said in favor, and then with third, and that's the words stated here. With third, some So, an argument arose among them. Who is the greatest? Some were saying, Lord Brahma is the greatest. Another group was saying, Lord Shiva is the greatest. You know, Ashutosh is easily pleased with the enemy. And then others were saying, Lord Krishna is the greatest. So they designated a personality, Saint Drigo. He was given the charge. Now, who is Saint Drigo? It's interesting to know. He is son of Lord Brahma. So if you were a choice, you would basically favor the personality who is close to you, right? Yet at the same time, Sage Trigo, being situated in the mode of goodness, he decided that he would test on one specific quality. And that quality is tolerance. He, in his heart, you know, made this determination that tolerance is surely a sign of greatness. So whoever is most tolerant would be the greatest. So with that mindset here, you know, started on his journey to discover who's the greatest among the three. And when we look at this particular topic, tolerance, you know, it connects us to the day we have today in the second. What's the day today? It's Mother's Day. Right? And mothers, they are of the most, of all the relationships we know, and of the characteristics mothers have, the most notable characteristic is tolerance. You know, when the baby is taking in the womb, right after, you know, as they are coming to that stage, do they take back to the baby? No, they are very tolerant. Actually, they become jubilant. That here, baby is kicking. You know, from say, somebody kicks us, we become annoyed with that gesture itself. It's a, a gesture of, a, you know, offense, first of all, and then it's actually disrespectful to kick someone. Yet at the same time, mothers they come children and the babies keep them in the way. So they are very tolerant. And from the very early stage, we see mothers practicing tolerance. And by seeing mothers, we realize, you know, how tolerant we should be. And tolerance is actually a reflection of love. Like we had Gita on during Holi here. And uh, during that time, there was one exercise where people were given glasses, right? And those glasses were colored differently. You know, some glasses were red, some were, you know, had red glasses. So anyone who saw, saw through red glasses, they saw everything red. Someone, they saw through the green glass, they saw everything green. So, when we put on the glass of love, what we say is, we can be more tolerant. So that's the characteristic we show. Just like a person wearing a red glass, is showing, seeing and showing that everything else is right accordingly. So we see a person's behavior and it's a reflection of love that the tolerance shows of a person. So as Brihumani, he started his journey. And some of the interesting thing is like, he is highly elevated. And uh, as he was in the company of these sages, these sages also included the Satarishis, you know, Bhaspati was also there. And Drupal is father of Shukrachari. So, yeah, his, of course, his progeny is also highly uh, scholarly. So, as Drupumani, uh, he proceeded, first he went to Pramalok, Satyalok. And in front of Lord Brahma, when he approached Lord Brahma, he didn't pay with his senses and he didn't give any respect. Now, that's pretty offensive, right? 
Wenn es auf all the living entities, in this material world, he's the first living entity, not Brahma. And doesn't get any respect or any prayers or any you know, response from someone who's coming in front of him. So Lord Brahma becomes very angry. However, knowing that Tripa is his son, a father's can be tolerant at times, right? With his intelligence, he was able to subdue that anger. And Srila Prabhupada writes also that this is just like, uh, you know, as water, which is produced of fire, can just uh, extinguish fire, of course, from Shri Mahavata. And he elaborates that, you know, from earth, water, fire, enter. So fire comes air, from air comes earth, or uh, water, and then from water comes earth. So even though water is a product of fire, it can extinguish fire. Similarly, by, you know, the humor of goodness and his mind is with his intelligence, he is able to subdue that anger. However, he was not completely able to hide it. So, Rivamani he noticed that his father got angry. So he left at that time. Again, I mean, he's living, there is no description of paying all his senses at that time also, he just left. Then he reached uh, Mount Kailash. And who said Mount Kailash? Shiva. Lord Shiva. So Lord Shiva, as soon as he sees Vrihu Muni approaching, he immediately gets up from his seat and walks forward to embrace his brother. And as Lord Shiva is about to embrace, Vrihu says, Oh, you are a demon entity. <laughs> you know, you are not pure, you are very pure. Because you smear all these ashes on your body. And where is this ashes, where all these ashes coming from? Yeah. yeah, so, you know, yeah, from the graveyard and, you know, similar places. And uh, so, hearing this, Lord Shiva becomes very angry. <laughs> Rudra, right? That's another name of Lord Shiva. Becomes very angry and he's about, he takes up his trident <laughs> on this occasion, about to kill Rinomuni. <laughs> and then, Goddess Bhavati, she intervenes and she comes in town. So when Lord Shiva is, you know, somehow able to subdue his anger, Bhagavan again leaves without having further conversation with his brother. Now he goes to Shwetati, Vaikuntha, and he is going, and what does he say? That Lord Vishnu is nicely resting on the bedstead of Anandashesh, the thousand footed serpent. And uh, he is Feet is being pressed by who? Goddess? Lakshmi. So, this is the scene, and of course, uh, Lord Vishnu is in Yoga Nidra. It's not regular Nidra like we have. Our Nidra is full of ignorance. His Nidra is full of transcendental bliss. <laughs> He's maintaining all the universes and all the fears of the universe. So, approaching Lord Vishnu, he thinks of doing something which is very offensive. And Shri Prabhupada describes he actually commits three kinds of offenses. First, he commits offenses by his mind. Then second, by his words. And third, by his action. So every next action is actually much more grievous than the previous one. It is mind, an offense, you know, is not as, because it's not apparent, and you just go from the mind, but still it's an offense. And then, with his words, now he's speaking it, and that is something that the receiver can receive. You know, from the mind, it can only be perceived through the senses. But the words can be very well received and can pierce someone's heart. It's said that words can be stronger than the swords at times. And if you remember somebody said bad word to you and how you felt, you know, it doesn't make you feel good and all those emotions emerge in your heart. And then the third offense he does is, he kicks the chest of Lord Vishnu with his feet. The biggest offense. And when he does that, what's the reaction? Lord Vishnu, being the master of all the universes, immediately gets up and pays all his senses to pay the money. And seeing her husband doing this, what is Bhagavad Gita going to do? 
și nu se pierd să vă mândă tine, and be so senses. Take the mood of a husband. She be so senses. To be bunia and God, which at that time says, Oh, forgive us, great sage, be bunia, that we did not welcome you properly. So first he is saying that we didn't welcome you, so maybe that's why you are so upset. And then second, he is saying is, that are your feet okay, because your feet are as soft as what? Lotus flowers. And my chest is like a thunderbolt. So when a lotus flower and thunderbolt will meet, who will get hurt for more? <laughs> of course, the lotus flower, right? Not the thunderbolt. Thunderbolt is so powerful. So he starts massaging Prigomani's feet. And uh, Prigomani, at that time, he's surprised, he's astonished, flabbergasted, right? Like, I just kicked him and he's pressing my feet, thinking that my feet are hurt, not taking any offense whatsoever. But at the same time, he just stands uh, there and then after that, he leaves. However, this incident in the purport, as well, uh, in Krishna book, Srila Purport explains, is not taken, you know, very well by Goddess Lakshmi. Because one of the reasons that Lord Vishnu has said was that now that your feet have touched my chest, it is removed of all the vices. And that's where Goddess Lakshmi decides. So I don't think she will go again because by nature Goddess Lakshmi is called Chanchala. Chanchala is very flickering. So sometimes she comes to Bhagavad then sometimes she goes to fulfill the wishes of her you know, devotees and then so she doesn't stay in the same place for a long time. And also, like in some family, she will go experience in Krishna go, if someone is very rich, you know, after a few generations the same family becomes poor. And someone who's very poor after a few generations, they can become very rich. And even within a lifetime, a person can go through richness and poverty. So that is the case with Goddess Lakshmi. And Lord Vishnu is assuring Vrimani that now that it's free of all the vices, Goddess Lakshmi would never want to leave this, you know, my chest. But Goddess Lakshmi, she's like, oh, she is not benevolently disposed since then towards Brahmanas. <laughs> and generally Brahmanas are poor because of that factor. She withholds her benediction. <laughs> and sometimes then, you know, in Kali age, some of the Brahmanas, they misunderstand this pastime and they think that we are so great that we can kick Lord Vishnu's chest. Oh no, <laughs> that's a big offense. It's just that, uh, Srila Prabhupada explains that Prabhupada was not a Vaishnava at this time. He had not realized the supremacy of Lord Vishnu. And so he had acted in this manner. If he was a Vaishnava, he would never act in the manner he acted. And it being a great offense, you know, it actually is um, regarded in that manner. And we feel very sorry for that action as a Brahmana that he did. Because he himself, is supposed to be showing what quality? Tolerance, right? Uh, in Bhagavad Gita, 18th chapter, the verse 42 explains the characteristics of a Brahmana, which is Shamu Namas Tapaha Shachan, Kantir Vajam Evacha, Jnana Vijnana, Astikyan, Brahman Karu, So the word Shanti, it's not Shanti, it's Shanti, with a half K, half K, which means tolerance. So Brahmanas by nature should be very tolerant. And then, uh, at the same time, it shows that even though one can be tolerant, there is a limit to that tolerance. And when one is pushed beyond that limit, the true nature comes out. So Vrikumani in this particular case goes back to the you know, bank of River Saraswati and shares his experiences with the other sages. And everyone concludes, who is the Supreme? Lord Vishnu is the Supreme. So this is again at the time 
when people were not aware of the primary creation. This is the secondary creation where the three deities, you know, are referred to as like Lord Brahma, he is in the mode, you know, controlling of the mode of passion and is responsible for creation of the material universe. Lord Vishnu is in control of the mode of goodness and he is the maintainer of the universe. And Lord Shiva is in you know, control of the mode of ignorance and is responsible to destroy the material universe. So they are performing these three activities. And along with all the Suras, um, Lord Indra, he is the king of the Suras. Now also very nicely it's described, now that we are talking about three words of material nature, you, we might want to know what are the people calling those three modes, right? In mode of ignorance, people, person who is in mode of ignorance is called Rakshasas. They are all deep, you know, Rakshasas, demons, demonic nature. Shri Shri Ganataya Ki Jaya Shri Shri Ganataya Ki Jaya And the persons who are in the mode of passion, the basic materialist, and are referred to as Asuras. And persons who are in the mode of goodness are referred to as Suras, which is demigods, right? They are all Suras. Now further, Shri Goswami continues to elaborate on another past time. Where in Dwarka, during the Brahma, he was very close to Lord Krishna's palaces. And uh, there, this Brahma, he would have, you know, he and his wife, they would have a baby. But as soon as the baby was born, the baby would die. And so this Brahma, he would take he would go to, uh, you know, go to Christian's palace and he would shout very loudly and he would blaspheme. Whoa, big word. You know, King Christian, calling him Shatra Bandhu. You know, again, the Dwish Bandhus, you know, that, you know, people who are born, you know, the progeny of one of the twice born personalities, like uh, Brahmana, Shatriyas, and Vashyas, they're called twice born. Because first birth is at the time of when the birth really happens, the physical birth. And then the second is when the samskars have been, you know, when you have gone through that samskar, kriya and so forth. And you attain initiation in one of the varanas. And people who cannot attain samskar, they say shudra. And so they are just shudra. So sometimes it so happens that uh, in Brahmana's family, a baby is born, but the baby when he grows up, or she grows up, they do not attain the qualities, they do not go to the samskaras. So they are called Brahma Kandu. Similarly, you know, Kshatriyas, if they do not attain and go to the samskaras of a Kshatriya, then they are called Kshatriya Bhattu. And similarly, there is Vaishya Bhattu. So he is calling King Bhukrasen, that King Bhukrasen is not performing his duties, because as the head of the state, there are three qualities he should have. First of all, he should have the qualities of a Kshatriya. He should be a good administrator. And a good administrator will not let even, you know, any of the other miseries, you know, Adhidevic miseries happen, occur in his kingdom. So there will not be any flood, there will not be any drought. None of those factors will be there. And everything will be nicely arranged. But here what is happening is some psychedelic event, which is very grievous thing to happen because when a father and mother they are young and a baby dies, that's very sad it's an incident. So you see. And then the second thing he's saying is that he's not performing all the religious duties that he's supposed to be performing. So when the head of, of the administrator administration, he is performing his duties, he's taking taxes from the citizens. And there is some reaction if not performed properly. So in this particular case, which comes to the third quality, where 
we should be selfless. So selfishness should not be, should not have self-interest in becoming rich. That's the third quality a minister we should have. So he should be completely devoted towards performing the welfare of the people in this case. And so he was saying, and who are all are there? He's addressing as well who are not able to protect his virgin. He's addressing Lord Krishna. He cannot protect my father. Then for Ram, Ananta, he cannot protect my father. Then he is saying Pradyupna, the great general, he cannot protect my father. And you know, all these generals, all these great Kshatriyas are there and my children are dying one after another. And this happens not once, not twice. How many times does it happen? Nine times. And on the tenth time, on the ninth occasion when he was saying all this stuff, it so happens that Arjun is present in Dwarka. Now this particular incident where that Arjun is present in Dwarka is after the Kurukshetra war. Because if Arjun had all the siddhis and all the capabilities at this time, he would have to take that war when Abhimanyu was killed. He would have just retrieved Abhimanyu. You will understand after this little fasting. It just so happens that uh, Arjun hears this and he couldn't believe it. And he says, Oh Brahmana, don't worry, I will protect your father. You know, if you have another baby on the way, then I'll protect that baby. Very much assuring the Brahmana. In Brahmana, he doesn't pay much attention to Arjun's words. He's like, when Lord Krishna and Lord Vallam, Pradyumna and Yudha will protect, how will you protect? <laughs> and Arjun says, oh, now this is where the passion, mood of passion is prominent in Arjun. He says, oh, I am not Krishna or Vallam. I am Arjun. You know, the bearer of the Gandhi Babu. So he's showing his powers. Realizing that, not even realizing that in Bhagavad Gita, during Kukshan's war in the beginning itself, Lord Krishna said, Parushan Vishu, all the ability in man, and the ability in man, right? So Arjun, forgetting all that, in the mode of passion, he is overcome by the mode of passion. And Chira Prabhupada has said, I have to explain that sometimes, Lord Krishna puts Arjun in this state to teach him the lesson, right? And in this particular case, Arjuna, all further he goes, says, okay, maybe Gandhi Prabhu is not enough, he's actually is. Because he's saying, now this again, he is to see the confidence appear in the uh, expressions of the Brahma. So he's saying, and I am the one who even satisfied Lord Shiva. And he gave me his Pashupata weapon. So I bear divine weapons as well, not just the Gandhi Prabhu. So at that time, Brahman, he is somewhat satisfied, okay, this is a personality, he is proving his qualification, I can you know, put my faith in him. So that's the interesting thing. Srila Prabhupada also made a distinction between religion and dharma. Dharma is our eternal nature, but religion is more associated with faith. And our faith can change, right? You know, today someone who is a Hindu can become a Christian, someone who is a Christian can become a Hindu, someone who is a Muslim can become a Christian, and back and forth. So that's related to faith. Your faith can easily change. But your dharma, your eternal nature cannot change. Chivira Sarupoi Krishna lifted us. So if you are not serving Krishna, you end up serving one of the energies of Krishna. No, nevertheless, our very nature is to serve, so we end up serving. That's dharma. So in this particular case, Arjuna having assured the Brahman is feeling very nice. Okay, I'm going to take care of things, take care of the matter of affairs. Then Lord Krishna will take care, right? And it just so happens for the tenth time, the Brahman's wife is expecting a baby. And the Brahman immediately comes to Arjuna and he says, Arjuna, come, protect my baby. You know, he's on his way. So Arjuna, when he comes to know that next, you know, he has to go, Arjun is meditating on who? Lord Shiva, not Lord Krishna. He's meditating on Lord Shiva because he says Lord Krishna can protect. So he's not qualified enough. 
So I have to look at some other authority. And this is the sign of a less intelligent man in uh, Bhagavad Gita. And Krishna explained to Arjun that they take shelter of a, one of the temple gods. And Arjun takes all his device weapons, including the Pashupata Shastra. And then he goes to the Brahmana's house. And it just so happened that at night time itself, he covers the whole hut of the Brahman from all sides, from top, from bottom, and from all this, all the sides, as well as south, east, west, and north, east, north, south, south, east, south, west, all ten directions are covered. And he's feeling confident. And then, near the uh, sunrise time, the baby is born, they hear the voice, and instead, what happens? The baby is gone, disappears with the body. In the past, at least the Brahman saw the body. This time, there is no body. What has happened? Only Shastras disappeared as well. <laughs> he has no divine weapon left. Everything's gone. He's shot. But he says, okay, I've got some cities. And then Brahman immediately comes to Arjun and said, my baby, for the tenth time. And what does he call it? Arjun? He calls Eden. Because Arjun was given, uh, you know, when Urvishi was upset with him, she said that you will be an Anur for a year. And Lord Krishna told him that that's to your benefit because uh, Arjun used it as really the cap was. So the Brahman is not lying, but it's too strong words. And it's really attacking Arjun directly. That when Lord Krishna, Lord Allah, could say, how, why, I was so foolish to put my faith in you. Arjun is, what to do? But he's thinking. So he heads towards which Loka to get the sun? He heads towards the resident of Yamaraj. You know, it's interesting. Normally you head towards the planet where the, all the living entities would go. So if you want to directly make an appeal to government, you would go to the Senate or some law abiding, you know, enforcing process like to the court and so forth. But he had so much siddhis by the mercy of Lord Krishna that he could approach the abode of Yamraj and you know literally like the residence of Yamraj. And he went there, he inquired, Brahmana's son is not there. He goes to Yamloka's Brahmana's son is not there. He's surprised. Then where is the son? So he goes to all 14 planetary systems in this material world. He can't find it's like, I don't know what happened. But as per my promise that I will enter the sacred fire and burn, he sets up the fire. He's about to enter and Lord Krishna again, you know, it has happened in the past, with Lord um, with Hanuman. Immediately stops searching, son, don't be foolish. You know, even if you enter the fire, people will indirectly, you know, think of you as low. You couldn't deliver your promise. I'll show you where the Brahmana's sons are. Now this is a shirt, right? If you guess the Brahmana's son, then he doesn't have to enter the fire. So he's looking at Krishna. Save me. And it's so interesting. All of a sudden from Lord Shiva to Krishna, the double shirt is there. It's desperate, right? This is a matter of life and death. And Lord Krishna immediately calls his chariot, Dharupas' his chariot here along with the four horses and he gets on the chariot with Arjuna and he starts going. And it is said that, you know, they cross the seven Sutudri and the seven oceans. So even to, uh, um, in the material universe, there are those uh, definitions given. So again, the GAD coming up, you'll be seeing that map of this universe, where it will be nicely described. So, and uh, as he's going, all the horses they're going through, they come to the edge of this material universe. And that edge is all darkness. And the horses, Lord Krishna is acting the role of a simple householder, Kshatriya king. And similarly, his horses, they also translate just like Lord Krishna. Yet at the same time, they behave as if they're just regular horses. And they lost their way in darkness. And showing us that the senses are limited. So they're behaving, showing that behavior, that effect. 
of this material world. And at that time, Lord Krishna made both who? Sudarshan. And Sudarshan is leading. So is very nice. Darshan is like one who you know reveals very nicely. And Sudarshan is leading the path, blazing like thousand suns. And now the horses are falling nicely and they cross over this um, the edge of this material universe and they see the cross of ocean. And within the cross of ocean, they finally approach a city, a city in the Quinta, where you know Mahavishnu, Lord Mahavishnu, also known as Purishottam. Uttam is important, Tam is ignorance. Put is who is transcendental, so he is transcendental to the three modes of material nature, such Purusha, as Purusha Mahavishnu is on the bedstead of Anantashesh. And Anantashesh is a thousand hooded serpent, you know, and with nicely gold bedecked helmets. And his complexion, Anantashesh's complexion is white. His tongue and his neck is said to be blue. Right, the poison. That's why Lord Shiva is not named that because he stored that halaha poison in his throat and it turned blue. And his tongue is also unanticious. All his thousand tongues, which are four generally, are blue in the throat. And then it's described uh, how Lord Vishnu is he's reciting, you know, resting on this bedstead of Anandashesh. And his body, his complexion is that of a cloud, the rainy cloud, bluish green. And uh, he is in meditation and he has got curly hairs, you know, which are flowing on his face and smiling very pleasantly. So, and uh, Lord Krishna and Arjun, when they approach, Lord Krishna, being the Supreme Master, teaches Arjun how to behave. Previously also, Lord Vishnu, when he was hit by, on the chest by Hanumani, he conveyed the same way to Goddess Lakshmi his behavior, right? Because Goddess Lakshmi could become angry because she saw her husband getting on and pay all his senses. And saying all those wonderful things. How can she behave differently? She has to follow. <laughs> Similarly here, Lord Krishna pays all his senses to Lord Vishnu. And it's interesting that he's paying all his senses to himself. But he's showing by his example, but as a human being, as a simple human being, when we approach a higher personality, a higher authority, we should pay that respect. So, Arjun seeing Krishna paying obeisances, pays obeisances to Lord Vishnu. And Arjun is surprised. We are in spiritual world, I couldn't tell. <laughs> That's something he didn't know. I mean, he couldn't do. Yeah, again. So, at that time, Lord Vishnu, realizing why they had come, said, Oh, I have taken away the Brahmana sign just because I wanted to do what? <laughs> to see Krishna. So Lord Krishna wants to see Krishna. Because Lord Krishna has four extra qualities than Lord Vishnu. Right? There is a group of Madhurya. And that's what is the interest here. Ras Madhurya. And Rup Madhurya is so beautiful. Lord Krishna is so beautiful. So he's much more beautiful. And uh, then the Smadhuri's past tense are full of transcendental errors. Vayu Madhurya, where he is expert in playing flute. And then Prem Madhurya, where he is surrounded by his loving devotees all the time. So in this particular case, when Lord Krishna is attracted to Lord Krishna, and he says, Sing Arjuna present day, then you continue to you know, provide or uh, continue to execute dharma as incarnation of Nana Rishi. And Srila Prabhupada had previously, uh, you know, shared that Nana Rishi were actually expansions of Lord Krishna. Of course, in first interview, the expansions of Lord Krishna are being discussed. Nana Rishi is named there, they are mentioned there. And they are referred to as Shakta Vishantas. And then previously, uh, Arjuna and Krishna they had approached the demigods, uh, the heaven, and again, uh, in the support, they had gone there as Nanaya Rishi, in the form of Nanaya Rishi. Anyway, and then Lord Vishnu, he, you know, 
returns the ten sense of the Brahmana. And the verse says, as they aged, they were of age and body. So, in a human part of translation, it is referred to as, as, you know, they were born. However, Srila Prabhupada in his translation, Krishna book says, as they were due to age, as they had grown over a period of time. Anyway, Krishna and Arjuna, they take the ten sons back to Dwarka, return it to the, the sons to the Brahmana. And at that time, what's the state of Arjuna? He is shocked. He is completely blown away. Now, this also shows and makes um, you know, Arjuna believe that Lord Krishna is very tolerant and he is the ability in man. So he realizes the instructions he had received. So that was the knowledge time when the instructions were given and this is the realization, the gyan realization. When Arjuna realizes that Lord Krishna is the most tolerant and the most versatile and he all the ability in us taught from Lord Krishna. So today's lesson was more towards tolerance as long you know, with his tolerance is continuing to be all the offenses we make, yet at the same time teaches us by his example how to behave, how to act in this world, in the material world. So we should continue to pray and increase tolerance. But then, as we say, okay, we should increase our tolerance. How can you increase our tolerance? Just practicing it? No. With love. So tolerance is actually a reflection of love. So how do you increase your love? That's the question. By serving. Oh. So you increase your love by serving. So any service would increase your love? Or devotional service? Devotional service. Now, how will you do to devotional service? You just go and start pushing people around and just start doing it or? We serve Krishna with love and devotion that helps us become, develop those uh, divine qualities also towards other living entities because everyone is part and parcel of Krishna. Yes. Yet at the same time, there is a process. Srila Prabhupada taught us the process. And the process is chanting of the Hare Krishna Mahamantra, where we pray to get the devotion service, and by serving, it enhances our love towards the Lord and all the devotees. And all the living entities, Surya Sarva Bhutana. Right? And similarly, as our love increases, you know, for that we chant Hare Krishna Mahamantra. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare. Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. And pray to the Lord to enhance our abilities and our tolerance and increase our love towards everyone. Hare Krishna. Any questions or comments? Hare Krishna. Tantra Shiva Bhagavatam ki jai, Shiva Prabhupada ki jai, Nanti Padayashan ki jai, Go Prihanandi. All glories to some devotees. All glories to some devotees. All glories to some devotees. Hare Krishna.